Hello, everyone. Welcome to Paradoxal Parodies Podcast here. And this is our first episode. And this one here, we're doing something that's a little bit um, something that people either have been doing for their whole lives or something else here. But it's with collecting. But it's not just any collecting. It's with video games, of course, here. But I'm not here by myself as I am here, David, as your host. I'm not here by myself. I'm here with C over here. And all that stuff. Go ahead and say hi, C. Hey guys, name's Zeon Omega, but you just call me Z for short. Because it's easier to remember, and everyone's gonna get confused for Zeon from like Kingdom Hearts, of course. But... No one knows how to pronounce the X ever. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's if it's not one thing, it's usually another. So, anyways, here, so we're talking about we're talking about something that people know or have been doing. Like I said earlier, is video game collecting, and now. Video game collecting is nothing really new in a sense, but it's probably the youngest hobby when it comes like compared to collecting like trading cards or comic books in that sense. And what we say here might help out with some other collecting parts of that or something there. But if not, again, like I said, this is mostly for collecting in video games here as it is. For all those people that are actually collect- collecting games uh, digitally through like Steam or like their own emulators, good on ya. It's just that having a physical copy is always good because having corruptible data always sucks. Because when you have corruptible data on a game, you gotta delete it and you gotta create a whole new file for your game. Right, uh, or if your PC decide, decides to crash and all that stuff and you have to reinstall Windows and that becomes a pain in the ass as it is yeah it's a go figure thing for all that but we are kids of the 80s and 90s and it's always been days of like from atari all the way to modern gaming consoles and even pc games as well so Mm -hmm. uh the main thing about the idea of this is that it is a hobby that is the number one warning of this it is a hobby if you have the budget for it cool if not there's no rush yeah there is never a rush and don't plan to, like, bank and retire on all of this. I mean, even if you have some games out in the five digits or, hell, even in the six digits, depending what game and what system it's for and everything, you should not expect to be um, banking on that to retire on and all that stuff. Because, like I said before, it's not something that, you know, everyone's going to go after for. Because it's not like comic book collectors or train car collectors or, hell, even automobiles in a sense there that, you know, you're not going to be able to retire off of something like this so don't just think that you're gonna have a hey i'm gonna get quick and get you know get rich off of this shit here as it is quickly and all that stuff that's not how this hobby here works or any collecting hobby i mean could it happen maybe but it's not usually what everyone aims for at least that's what i like to think but eh, what do i know this is one of those hobbies that is good for nostalgia purposes mainly Uh, If you played a game that you played way back when, you can actually get that game again, either by digital means, or if you can actually find a copy, you can always have it on hand, ready to go. Right. And one of the questions that people should be asking themselves is, why are you collecting Fayo games? Again, we kind of said it's for nostalgic purpose or sometimes for collecting in value. But... Me and C here will go over why we collect and all that stuff and our own rights here. And I'll let C go first here for this one. Uh, When it comes to me, it is mainly for nostalgic reasons. But the thing is, is I am also a collector of quality games. So they have to be like games that have a lot of replay value. They're timeless classics usually. And they're also even decently worth a pretty penny if it is coming to cost at all. Uh, Usually they are hard to find. But what we are going to be doing throughout this podcast is giving you references of what to look up as far as value on that. Also, how to collect uh, piece by piece on a game if you ever want to complete a piece when it comes to a video game. Right. And for me, when it comes to collecting, and it's also for nostalgic reasons as well here too, because unlike C here, I'm more of a 90s kid and C is the 80s kid here. But he know he actually grew up with the 90s of different things while I was, you know, starting off with my own stuff. But for me, I miss those different, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it like, like, what was it, a different decade ago, I guess, is what it would be called nowadays, I guess. 
But I miss those simple days where you could just go ahead and just have a physical thing in your hand and slap into the machine and play it and all that stuff and not, you know, and get your money short. Was it perfect? No, but not by no means. It's but, the entire game. No DLC. No yeah. additional stuff unless it is after production stuff. Right. And also there are sometimes... I do collect if it's for value, sometimes, but not always. It's mostly for games that I would like to play and everything else. And, you know, something that has to have good replay value and everything else. Like, for me, I can always get a kick out of Kingdom Hearts, as an example. But we'll get into the, what we mean by, you know, quality games and what we think is, like, replay value and all that stuff. But, yeah, mine's just more of nostalgic. And sometimes it's a value. Yeah, that's a bonus, mostly. But I like to have fun with my games and not worry about getting everything CIB complete in box and everything because eh, sometimes it's worth it and there's sometimes where it's not basically so that's just how it is for me anyways <clears throat> excuse me here so another question would be is is price charts or price charting depending on how it's worded or other websites like it are useful or how should they be used do you want me to go first on this one, or should you go first on this one? You go ahead. All right. So, for people who don't know, there is a website called Price Charting. Now, Price Charting is what it exactly sounds like. It's a price guide that shows in today's market, in a sense, of how much games are valued at and how much they're worth. Before, um, they started adding different things to it, because like nowadays, if I look it up here, um, it used to be just where... It was just uh, loose price, complete price, and new price. Then, <clears throat> as they start going on, they start going ahead and adding in like graded prices, box only, and manual only. And with a website like this here, it should only really be used as a reference guide to how much should I be paying for. It's not a it's not a price guide of this is how much you should be selling it for, and this is the holy bible, and thus saith the Lord that this is how much this game is going for. That's not how this thing should be used. And we have an example of someone that we used to know as a friend um, misused it that way. Or at least that's what I like to think. But price charting is just more of a re reference guide. No matter how you're going to splice it, basically. And when it comes to the actual collecting of games, one way to actually do things... Uh, I like to actually do this as well as I actually have an app that connects with price charting quite well. Uh, you can actually look up the game itself using this app. I think it's just called video game pricing or something like that. Uh, but no uh, no we, yeah, keep going. No we yeah, but uh, you just look that up while you have the game in your hand, and you can actually see a difference between uh, we're going to begin to this later, but like the loose price to the complete price to the new price. We will be, like I said, we will be explaining what the difference is between those three in a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be like major price gaps and when it comes to stuff like that you probably if you want to get it for like a monetary value of things get it for the loose price and then just piece it together to make it complete yep and for the app he's talking about um it's called video game price charts here but it does connect to um price charting basically so it's about the same one in the same there and everything it's not else. it's not directly price charting but it does link to it yeah, just link to it and everything else. And again, it should be used that way. I mean, hell, we even know someone who uses um, eBay pricing and all that stuff. And you know who I'm talking about. It's for um, that one guy, um, Kyle, who who owns his own um, business. What was it called? Boss Stage Arcade, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and he does it through um, eBay and everything else. But since you actually dealt with him when it comes to selling, how does he go through with eBay with you here, see? Uh, well, that's only when it comes to, like, the special orders that he actually doesn't have of whatever mm -hmm. uh, we actually want to get. If he wants to help with that, then he will usually charge whatever he actually gets for it. So if he has to pay a particular price plus shipping, he is going to charge that. But if he already has it with whatever products he has, the sticker price is not 100% the sticker price. It is negotiable. It just mm -hmm. depends on how well are you willing to negotiate and how professional you're going to be about it. Yeah, and as an example here, um, I negotiated with him for getting um, the Lunar, the complete 
um, um, what was it? Lunar Silver Star complete story, or however it's what I'm getting my title mixed up. But it's the first um Lunar game on the PS1 before you have Internal Blue for the. That's the second game on the PS1, and I each, negotiated with him on that one. Each version, each version of those Lunar games have just the games themselves, and there's one that has a lot of paraphernalia on it. He got the paraphernalia one. Yeah, and while I paid more than probably what Price Starting has said. Um, there's a reason why I was okay for paying as much as I did, because in total, and I'm not afraid to say how much I paid for it, it's because when everything was there, um, the condition was good, I had everything that was supposed to be with it, and everything else, and plus it's a small local business, I ended up paying for 110 for it. Now, someone might say, that's overpriced on it, but for me, when I take into account that how good the condition is and everything else, it does add to it, but like how... C said, we're going to get into about conditions and how things play out because conditions play a lot more part of it than just the value of it because even if a game is worth, like, let's say about 80 bucks loose, but it has a major scratch on it, that pricing of it from 80 bucks is not what they're going to get. They're going to get a different pricing altogether for that kind of thing. But that's for later on as we talk about this. All right. Next question is, how to trade to another business or another buyer to get top dollar and the best deal for both ends? This does pertain to, again, our buddy Kyle at Boss Stage Arcade. Um, but uh, when it comes to trading in to get, like, uh, cash or store credit, just to let you know, people, when it comes to these um, vendors, they don't want to give you full price because you're trying to pretty much hawk the item to them, pawn it off. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're going to get it to where they can still make a profit off of whatever you are giving up. And what you want to do is you want to find a person that's willing to make a fair, a more fair price to what you want. You don't want to gouge a price. What you want to do is you want to try and make the most of it and just work with what you got. Yeah, and also something there to boot is um, be honest when you are selling these items and everything else because uh, if the condition of it is not that great but the person still wants it, work within the means of the pricing and don't just try to gouge for a higher up pricing. Even if it's a harder find the game and all that stuff, like for example, if I want to sell my um, NES game of Shattered Hand, which is about like a 40, like 40 to 50 dollar game. Now, if the label was not that good on there and all that stuff, but if the person really wanted it that much, then, you know, we would negotiate a pricing for it. And who knows, he might get it for about 40 or maybe even a little bit less than that, depending on how negotiating goes and how much things are. But again, you should be honest when it comes to condition and all that stuff. And hell, even, and don't be afraid to ask the sellers or the people who you're going to give it to, you know, questions about the game. Because, let's be honest, not everyone knows underneath the sun about each individual game, like what they came with, and if there were special editions or limited editions or whatever wording you want to use for that, etc., etc., and stuff like that. Because, you know, there are some things that only went with some sets, basically. And you may you may not know, but the cell might know that. And if you figure if you can figure that kind of stuff out, you'll be able to make some kind of either you know trade or deal or whatever, depending on how you're trying to do this. And just so you know, you can be easily cheated by someone who makes something known as reproductions. We'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is not exactly a bad thing when it comes to reproductions it's that's just more of a value thing but like i said we'll get into that in a little bit yeah which is actually uh let's see here we can either answer that question or we can just answer a different question if you want to see uh well it is the it is the next question that i'm seeing here are the reproductions so all right so are reproductions a good or a bad thing now for people this is more of a a debate thing is how I want to see this because when it comes to reproductions, it means it's not the original. It's what it means for what well, at least when it comes to video games, it's a copy of a co of a original or whatever, basically. Like I just said earlier, and it's a physical, actual copy of it, and there's nothing really wrong with having a reproduction. 
it's just the matter of the price gouging. Yeah, because um, what should be what people should do, and hell, even if you look this up on eBay, like as an example, and we'll list some examples on here that you can see for yourself. Like for me, I've been looking for for a game called um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: uh, The Hyperstone Heist, and now that game is is an expensive game by itself. Okay. But now there are people who sell reproductions at lower pricing, but they actually say reproduction in them. And for me, how I stand on reproductions is this here. If there's a game that was never released, like, for example, like Mr. Gimmick on the NES, because it was never released, and the only way you could play that game is through a reproduction card. Another example you could say is uh, Mega Man, The Wily Wars on the Sega Genesis. While Europe and all of them had, you know, physical copies of it, us over here in the United States, we never had a physical copy of that because we had, like, on the Sega channel, which was its early form of, what's a good example of that? Like, uh, some internet provider kind of thing or something like that where you could play games? Like, what's an example of that? Are you talking about, like, a Sega channel or something like yeah, that? Yeah, the Sega channel, yeah. I was just trying to think of what 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 was something that was like that back in the day. If you people don't understand that Sega Channel is old '90s stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm trying to make it as a comparison. But we never got you know any of that here. The Wily Wars there, and that was on the Sega Channel. And the only way you could play that game is through a reproduction card. So that's understandable for that. There, although sometimes where people make reproductions with English on um, patch translations for some games that was from overseas. Now, some people are okay with it, and some people are not. It depends on how they want to look at it. Now, what people really get really upset about in some of this is about reproductions on games that were actually licensed and all that stuff. And not only that, but they cost a lot of money. Like, for example, some people have done reproductions of Little Samson, an NES game. And if people don't know <laughs> that history of it, it's pretty much, it's a game that was once 50 bucks you get from the store, and now over on eBay, it goes for about a thousand bucks easy for an authentic now, one. <laughs> now, another good example is uh, when it comes to the game Earthbound. You can get the legit for a couple hundred dollars, or you can get the reproduction cartridge, which is called Earthbound Uncut. There really isn't much of a difference, except for the fact that Earthbound Uncut is basically just the title for the reproduction. It's a good way to tell that it's a reproduction. However, when it comes to those more subtle ways, like people want to make it look authentic, you can actually get tools to look inside of the cartridge itself to know whether things are reproduction or not. Yeah, but these are called security bits, and... The security bits on something like you can just go to like a Harbor Freight, a Home Depot, or Lowe's, or anything to find these at. This is one of those that, at least from my experience, yet you had to order it off online off of either eBay, Lugi Games, Amazon, things like that. There and there are security bits that kind of look like a star one, except um, they're different. And if people want to see what it looks like, I would just link down below what. You know what an example of this is, but you want to grab one of those um, security bit toys. I think one was like 3.5, and the other was like 4.5 for the Sega Genesis ones or something like that. And basically, you want those to see what it looks like on the inside, because to tell if a game's really real or not, you want to look at the circuit board and everything else. And there are websites online that can tell you what is a real circuit board that was used by either Nintendo, Sega, or whatever. The ones you want to, you know, what the they have, use. they have their own watermark and identifying marks to make sure to know that they are authentic. Mm -hmm. For the most part, and that's why you want to actually check and make sure. Now, hell, even if you went to your local game store or something else like that, there, and you're buying an expensive game and you want to make sure it's actually the legit deal, they will take their time and actually open it up and show you that it's a legit thing and everything else. See, most of the time reproduction ROM boards would never look like the actual, you know, real deal Nintendo Sega circuit boards or whatever, basically. And, again, it's one of those you can look up on your own for that there to get an idea of what we're talking about. But you usually want to look for the watermarks, what year it is, and also what type of board it is. At least that's how I've been 
looking it up. When I buy games off of eBay, I open it up. I look and see if it's a legit thing or not. Then I look up what the circuit board thing is and all that stuff and what model, etc., etc. And that's how I know it's a real thing. So you want to educate yourself on stuff like that. So that way you know what you're getting yourself into. All right. So now still on the subject of reproductions, it's mainly the game. Uh, when it comes to reproductions of whether it's okay to get at, at whatever price they want you to get it at and you actually prove that it's not reproduction. But mm-hmm. even if it is, you get it at a decent price. It, when it comes to reproductions, they usually don't have like uh, boxes or manuals to go with it. But however, there are times when you actually have the loose item, the cartridge itself, and you want to complete it. Now this is what we were talking about between in price charting, they have the loose, new, and the complete in box. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to those those three statuses, the loose is just the game, or it's anything but the complete set, which is which includes the game, the manual, the box, and whatever else that particular box comes with. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the trick of it: is that people will usually frown upon, like, uh, what about reproduction manuals or reproduction boxes? The value is in the game itself. Yeah, That's the main issue. Because, uh, go ahead. Yeah, because, let's be realistic, people. Even if you want it to be the 100% authentic, like, cardboard box and everything else, like, the way how the Super Nintendo and the N- NES one um, boxes were, let's be real, if you really want those, you can find those if you want to. But... I'd rather have a hard case instead of a cardboard case, because sooner or later, you're going to wear it out, and it, once, it used to be nice and looking new, and whenever, whatever side you open it from the most, it's going to start to weather out and everything. So unless you want to keep replacing those, I always say get a hard case for it and call it a good day. Some people want the authentic thing of actually doing the whole cardboard thing and everything else, but as I explained, I don't like always doing the whole cardboard look, because sooner or later, the box is going to look ugly from you opening it up so much. It's going to disintegrate in your hands, basically, considering it is just cardboard. And uh, when it comes to the manuals, again, these things are just physical bodies that are good for your collection just to make it, just to make whatever game you are trying to complete more worthwhile, even though if it's just like even by a couple of cents. Because sometimes that happens, but sometimes getting a... And I have an Five example dollar. up here. Sure, go ahead. All that stuff. Yeah, so... Well, it was like when I helped out C here, when I came to, like, um, Chippendale Rescue uh, Rangers for the NES. See, because, like, what? You had only the, what? The box and... It was, was the it? box and the game. That was it. And the thing is, is it only costed, like, $28. Yep. So, he paid 28 bucks, and technically it would have been loose for about, at least according to price charting, $12.50. But since I helped him out, saying, hey, here's some eBay listings I have, you know, what was it, the manual and everything, and how how much you paid for I think it was like, what, 9 to 10 bucks for the manual? Yeah. Yeah, it was 9 to 10 bucks for the manual, and he went from 28 and it went up to $50.60 as complete. That's... That's turning a loose product to a complete inbox from what we actually know. I'm sure there were like little ads to actually go with it, mm-hmm. but you can't always find those. And that's understandable. But when it comes to the actual reproduction manuals, you want to try and get those to complete your box at least. Because when it comes to price charting, they mainly grade it by the game, the box, and the manual. It doesn't have to be an actual factual legitimate box. You can probably bring down the price if you ever want to sell that because it's not a legit box. But it's still worth keeping as such. Yeah, it's like if I wanted to go ahead and sell like uh, my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, 3, the Manhattan Project, the manual is legit, the game is legit, the case is the only thing that's custom. But instead of being like for whatever it's like 90 bucks or whatever it's going for now, I would bring it down at least about maybe 80 or 75 depending what mood I'm in. But that's just because I can I can sell that way if I want to. Now, if it was actually authentic and it was the original one, then I would keep it at 90 and because of condition, I might lower it down then. But again, it really depends on how you want to look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. But, and also too, with manuals, sometimes it's better off to get a reproduction of a manual because even if you get lucky enough to find some original manuals off of eBay, 
some of them aren't always in great condition. Like, for example, I recently bought Pokemon Crystal the manual. I have the game. I have the manual. I just don't have the box for it. But the manual has, like, some stains on it. But at the same time, it's it's in good condition or acceptable condition, should I really say. But it's still readable, and it only costs me about, like, five to six bucks to get for free shipping, okay? Or something like that in total. So, it was worth it to me to actually get because it was actually cheaper, unlike the other ones. Now, if you want a good one, depending on, sometimes you go you can go from 10 bucks to 20 bucks or whatever, because it really kind of ferries out on what what manual for the game it is. If it's for a common one, you're not going to pay that much, but if it's for an expensive one, you're going to pay a shitload of it, basically. As for how value fluctuates, mainly on price charting, uh, David, we were talking about... Uh... Mm -hmm. Legend of Zelda, A Link to the yeah. Past, for example. We, we were looking into that today, and we were just weirded out by the way that that actually works from loose to complete inbox, because it's like uh, like $15 or something like that. Let me take a look Yeah, here. I got it here. I got it up here. Okay. So, normally for loose pricing, and again, depending where you're at, you can find probably less than what I'm going to to say for the pricing, but loose is going for about 25 bucks. Now, you can probably find this at, you know, some other, like, Dodge video games at Game Force or whatever your local game store is. And it might be about maybe that 25 to 30 or sometimes, hell, even maybe 15 if you get lucky enough, okay? It's not the most expensive game. But the complete pricing for this, according to what it says, is about, it's going for $108.89. That's, that's that's over an eighty dollar profit just on completing that alone, and with the way that price charting does things now, because this these are actually added new, mm -hmm. is they actually have like Legend of Zelda is actually perfect for this. It actually has a box only price that people are selling this on for forty dollars. Okay, then... so it it's still it's still a decent price. It doesn't cost as much as the game loose, but if you add that and the manual, which is a less just a little less than eight bucks, that's forty eight dollars. Plus another twenty five. That's still if once you complete all of that, you still get forty dollars over your value, and yeah. that's one of the best ways to actually work with fluctuations of prices. Also, because of the fluctuations in prices, because you always want to check when you're game shopping for these things, mm -hmm. uh, they don't always follow twenty four seven on these prices. So if you see a big change, a big fluctuation in price charting, or anything like Amazon or eBay, take advantage of it. Go ahead and, uh, if you feel like you want to get it, go ahead and get it. And take advantage of the fact that that price is most likely going up as it's yep, going. And, yep, and if you're wondering how price charting does it here, there was a, web pa there was a page on our FAQ about saying, um, how the methodology works, and it says this here. At PriceCharting.com, our goal is to track the market price of all video games over time. We collect sold listing data from eBay and our own um, video game marketplace, and this runs information through our pri priority algorithm to calculate the current market price and all that stuff. So they they actually do use algorithms to keep up with how things are going, but the stores where you go and check out these games don't always do that. They like check it maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week at most. So if you find something decent, say like uh, we have Second and Charles, which is a secondhand media store around us. Yeah. I go to my location and I find a PlayStation 2 uh, game called Kuon, K-U-O-N. And when I got that, I got that for the original uh, forty nine ninety nine that a PlayStation Two game would cost back then. And mm -hmm. now this is like uh, I want to say about two years later, and complete in box it is now. It says one hundred seventy seven dollars, and that's been uh, fluctuating around that area. So technically, just by me taking a guess of actually. Uh, finding a good game, it turns out to be a really a real collectible. Yeah, and also keep in mind, and if you ever watch like something like Storage Wars or some like, other shows like that, keep in mind whatever they say about video games, take it with a grain of salt. Do not assume that all your video games 
are worth like the hundreds and hundreds of dollars as they say because that's not the case always with that okay that's just those are those are unfortunately a lot of those are staged anyway we're trying to help you guys just actually build up a collection that you would like having um we're not yeah. judging you by what what games you would want to get but we're also trying to not break your wallet every time you go to a store that has these sort of things mm -hmm, because you should only buy within your means and all that stuff easier said than done sometimes i mean who hasn't had a bad you know what was a bad itch to buy things because we know someone who regret that later but we will get into that story a little bit as this podcast goes on but you know you just need to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into with all this here and we're trying to help you out to build a collection some resources for you to use again right you should use your own description and everything else but you should not be uh, using this as this is the holy bible guiding of all this again you can see how some other people have done this but we're just going by, by our own experience in this whole entire thing okay so the next question is what systems are easy to collect for now this um did you want to go first on this one or should i in this case? this one is a little tricky considering lately when it comes to a lot of actual consoles that have been coming out mainly with classic editions and whatnot it kind of gives you a feel of which ones you would like better than the other Right. The biggest competition before all of these Xbox versus PlayStation was Sega versus Super Nintendo. Uh, you can actually look up what a Genesis lot of games. Does, lo what Nintendo don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the thing with collections is if you want to actually have a game worth playing and is actually decently priced, you usually want to go and get the Sega version of the game. But if you want a really nice collectible version of the game itself. You'll want to get the Super Nintendo. Why is that? I have no clue. But that's just the way that they've been actually doing things as far as the quality of the games go. I probably Say have a guess about why that is here if you want to hear that part of it. Go for it. Interrupting. So, you said the Sega Genesis is more for replay value, correct? And you said the Super Nintendo was more for collectible value, right? Pretty much. Alright, so reason why I would say I do agree with that, and it's because of this here. Sega has more different varieties than what Super Nintendo will ever have for this case. Now, before you guys say anything, I'm not going to say that the Sega Genesis had the best RPGs. That's a joke in itself, okay? Because we know the Super Nintendo was known for more um, role-playing games than the Sega Genesis ever does. I mean... As I would tell people, on a Sega Genesis name, five role-playing games right away if you can. But with Super Nintendo, you can do that with a snap easy. And for me here, it was more variety, and they experimented more on the Sega Genesis than they ever did on the Super Nintendo. While Super Nintendo, it was more of, we're going to play it safe and know what best strengths and weaknesses are. But at the same time, we're going to make sure we have that great quality. Because let's be honest, even when Sega did experiment, and there were some things that were hit or miss. Like, for example, what was a hit? Earthworm Jim, Gunstar Heroes. Adventure games. Like that. Yeah, adventure games. I mean, hell, they even had um, a Scooby-Doo adventure game that was kind of like, it's so, in a way like how um, the Day of the Tentacles and the Lucas Arts games had their own interface. It was kind of set up in that sense. Yeah, and... it's it's the same thing when it comes to a lot of um, the genres, kind of like the way that it is. It's even with the modern consoles on how it's going. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've gotten into plenty of discussions with people who are like Xbox fans on why people can't do like multi-platform releases. When it comes to uh, Xbox fans, the way that the controller is set up, for example, it's perfect for mainly FPS shooters or adventure games like skyrim and whatnot meanwhile when it comes to playstation playstation is a lot more universal it is good for multiple genres of any kind and it is decent with even those ones that xbox has now when it comes to sega and super nintendo the same kind of goes it, it goes the same way i mean mainly when it comes to the sega the sega was a lot more for side-scrolling beat-em-ups and side-scrolling 
uh, adventure games. Like, Sometimes, like for example, so- like Golden Axe, Street, Streets of Rage, and all that stuff. I mean, hell, you are a beat-em-up fan, you will love that system, because Streets of Rage 2 is probably the best one out of that series, and Golden Axe is pretty good, too, and it's alright, therefore, what it is. Oh, I like those games a lot better than Final Fight, as it is. It's right, but when it comes to... Cool. And, and again, when it came to, like, the Super Nintendo, which was in competition with the Sega at the time, it was more universal. That was where most of the actual games came out was for that. But Sega worked with whatever they could as far as their own rendition of the game. Like uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, for example, you can have a Sega Genesis and a Super Nintendo edition. But due to the fact of Sega only having the for the actual three buttons to interact with on the right side of the controller except the turbo which has six uh, right. it's it's not as universal as a super nintendo which has six buttons that you can interact with at all times other than the d-pad so it just worked a lot it was a lot more flexible than the sega yeah but and also even when you had the six button controller not all games registered the whole six button controllers I mean, sure you can have it register for like fighting games and everything else, but the six button controls were mostly made for that alone, really. If you come down to think of it, I mean, I rather have the six button controls if I wanted to play a good old fashioned game like Street Fighter Two and all that stuff, okay? But for like a side scroll thing, I can go with either one. But like I said, not all the games on Sega Genesis could actually, you know, read the input of. You know, the six button controls. I mean, it could read A, B, and C, but I wouldn't read X, Y, and C with it sometimes, okay? So, and then, of course, throw in there. And, and then, of course, when it comes to like the, the Sonic the Hedgehog games, you know, with two basic mm-hmm. uh, controls when it comes to Sonic, basically, you have the D pad left and right, but you also have all three buttons, every single one of them, jump. causing a jump button. They don't have any other purpose, they just have jump. Or when it comes to the later games, he can do the super spin when you hold down at the same time. It, it doesn't matter what it does. Is that that was a pretty basic layout for the controls of Sonic the Hedgehog in its earlier days. Yeah, and it worked out for what it is and everything else. And again, like I said, Sega had more experimentation with its games than the Super Nintendo. And that's why I said earlier... Super Nintendo played it safe and just played to their strength and all that stuff. Now, some people may, <coughs> excuse me, may not like the Super Nintendo because not a lot of them have a, a lot of time to play role-playing games. And if that, and if you think about it, role-playing games was more prominent on the Super Nintendo than it was on the Genesis. Again, one of the only like role-playing games I can think of. Besides Fantasy Star series on the Sega Genesis, would have been the Shining Force series was another one, like Shining in the Darkness, Shining Force 1 and 2. And then another one would have been Beyond the Oasis, which is its own top-down kind of role-playing game as it is. And there was another one. I'm trying to think of it. Shit, what was it here? But, like I said, (coughs) it was not known for, you know, RPGs like how later on the N64 was not known for role playing games, unlike the PS1 in that sense, how that got flipped around. So, depending what genre you were going for, one was better than another. I mean, hell, even Sega did a lot better with sports games than it did on the Super Nintendo because that's kind of what it was made for in a sense there, too. I mean, you tell me if you watch any of those commercials or seen any of the packing games for some of them, not all, but some of them. Most of them were either sports games or it later became with Sonic the Hedgehog or something else later. Or something like that. I'm kind of remembering it right, I think. Am I right? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, like I said, it's been a while since I had to think of this history. So if I get it wrong, I apologize. But my point is, overall, is you know, there's going to be one system that has one genre that you may or may not like. And it does better for which one. And like I said, if you're not a role-playing guy or anything, you're not going to like the Super Nintendo as much as you would the Sega Genesis then, okay? Because Super Nintendo is prominent in the whole RPG thing. Because there's not a lot of side-scroll beat-em-ups besides the only one I could think of is like Final Fight and Sonic and Sonic Man. Other than that, there's not a lot, really, 
by that comparison. If you, at least that's how I feel. Now, but, even Sega, after it left its uh, experimental stage, it actually went a little too far ahead of its time with the Dreamcast, for example, and there are actually a lot of collectible games in that alone, but when it came to its actual uh, controller configuration, it is very similar to the Super Nintendo controller of the ABXY method. Yeah, with that left and R trigger going on for it as it is, but at least if you want to play a game that had that can read all the buttons, at least the Dreamcast had games that can read all the freaking buttons, like the Mad Cats, um, you know, Dreamcast controller. I have one of those, and if I wanted to play a fighting game, I would use that to play fighting games with. Because I'm not—I hate doing left as my high punch and right as the right, uh, right, but as my, you know, high kick. High kick, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had a brain fart there for a second, but yeah, it really depends and all that stuff. But let's see here. Let's get back to this here. So, the next question is. What are your personal rules for building a collection? Or what rules should you have? I just add that part into it. These aren't much of rules, it's just more of preferences. Uh, for example, with me, like I said, I actually not only want games that have a decent uh, monetary value to them, but just in case I ever feel like playing them again, I want to keep on having the chance to play them and still be entertained by them. Right, and for me here, it is also... Like I said before, it's nostalgia, but at the same time, I want to have fun with games that, you know, that I feel like I can always go back and play and enjoy myself. Like, for example, probably one of the biggest games that I could say that I have a connection to that goes with that is the first Kingdom Hearts game on the PS2. I feel like I can always go back to that game no matter what and actually have my, you know, fun with it. And still continue to play it and, you know, be able to play it in different ways and all that stuff. That's one game that if I had nothing but an eternity to play on, yeah, Kingdom Hearts would be that kind of game. Or Kingdom Hearts 1.5 or 2.5 for that matter. Now, that's see, just me. when it comes to the collector's purpose of it, mainly it is with the idea of you want a lot of bang for your buck. Now, the perfect company that you would want to look into for something like this, unfortunately, they are no longer with us, is uh, Working Design. They are the creators of the Lunar series. A lot of their rights went to Xseed, which actually does a decent job with their stuff as well. But the thing is, is that when it came to Working Designs, when you paid for like the 60 or $70 for Lunar when it first came out, you would get the game, you would get the manual, you would get what is known as the Omake Box, which is a which is a small book sized box of like little filler things some of it is like uh, one of the characters in two Lucia you get her pendant an actual factual pendant in a velvet pouch okay and it just cool. looks nice that's very cool and uh, you would also get these little stand up uh, little cardboard uh, Bus, basically, yeah, little little portraits of the characters that you can put around your little workspace if you just want it to look cute. But uh, it just had a lot of stuff to go with it. And the thing is, is that Working Designs worked with so many other games that if you actually look them up, especially if they are new or complete inbox, their price goes up substantially just because of all of that stuff. And some examples of this, of what you saw, maybe say the Lunar games and some of the other ones he just named, would be they also did Magic Knight Ray Earth on the Sega Genesis, um, Shining Shining Wisdom for the Sega. Se I'm a, not sorry, sorry. Magic Knight Ray Earth for the Sega Saturn. I said Genesis. Damn it, people. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I know what I said and I know what I meant. Damn it, and I meant it 100. percent No, I'm kidding. I'm I'm done doing a Doctor Seuss joke. Anyways, Shining Wisdom on the Sega. Um, Saturn, and then they also did um, Lunar, Silver, the Silver Star, and Eternal Blue on the Sega CD, and on the Turbo Graphic 16, they did one of uh, Cosmic Fantasy 2, Exile, Exile, Wicked, um, Phenomenon. I think I might be saying it right. I may be wrong. Um, Peril one Soul of Stars. their one of their most uh, collectible, as far as cost goes, is their Elemental Gear Bolt uh, limited edition. That is like an assassin's case. It's got the game. It's got these nice little tools to use on the game. And it just looks really fancy. It's all shiny. It's so pretty. 
Yep. And that was for the PS1. And another one that they did was also um, Ray Storm, Ray Crisis, um, Thunder Force 5, The Fee, I think it's for Rumor Numero, so that is 5. Vagabond, Vanguard um, Bandits was another one. And for the PS2, um, they did one called Sliphead, The Lost Planet, um, and stuff like that. And that's just some of their works they also have done as well for that there. So. That's just to show you, it's an idea that some game companies, um, when they go out of business, there's sometimes where they can be worth a lot of money for some of their games and all that stuff. You don't think they would, but some of them are and all that stuff. Or you can have a current one, like Atlas, for example, and some of their games can be worth it, but that's for a different reason entirely than what working the science is. And you can explain this one, see, because you know how it is when it comes to Atlas games. Uh, when it comes to Atlas games, we... It, they they have their own, like, moniker when it comes to genres. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to, like... They, they mainly limit their prints. That's mainly what they do these days. Like, one of the... Late, uh, the later PS2 titles, for example. I mean, it came out once the PS2 was actually losing its peak time, and that was uh, the game Rule of Rose. Uh, this was a... Sorry, if I'm chuckling, um, there's a reason why, because that game... <laughs> okay, the, the point of this game, it's a scavenger hunt. That's mainly all it is, is it's a scavenger hunt. You're going through this story... And I, I don't I don't want to get into too much about it, but the thing is, is you don't you don't have any like guns to shoot with until much later on in the game, and I mean like the last five minutes of the game. Uh, you actually use mainly the stuff around you to defend yourself against whatever is fighting you at the time. But it's just the fact of when I actually got this, it was like fifty bucks. And then how I've, much had is it, it I've had I've had I've had I've had it complete the entire time. And to this day, complete inbox, it is just under 200 right now. Isn't that ridiculous or what, folks? Okay. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, I'm looking, at the, <laughs> I'm looking even at the manual only price. Get this, David. The manual okay. only price for Rule of Rose is just under $80. $80. Holy shit, man. <laughs> that's, that's the most expensive <laughs> manual I have ever seen on price charting. 80 bucks for a manual. Man, that manual better have some gold in there or some other things. And again, folks, I'm laughing because I'm going, that game isn't, isn't the best thing ever, but apparently everyone thinks so because look how much it's going for now. I'll, I'll give it this. I'll give it this. <laughs> in all of its actual bland way of me explaining it, it is actually a decent game to play. Yeah. I wouldn't mind playing it again. It's actually great plot wise for its own little universe yeah. but 200 bucks for complete, complete i mean even even loose it's 144 this me this usually means that it's a that is a limited print they didn't make a lot of them they weren't expecting a big fan base for this but when it comes yeah. to atlas atlas alone has a big fan base so they would want so all these collectors of Atlas would want to get their hands on this, no matter what. Just and to say, another, guess what? I got it. Yeah, and another way you could say that is with Way Forward. Now, what's Way Forward for known for doing now? Well, if you don't know the Shantae series, fine. You should know it for it doing DuckTales Remastered is another one. To it doing Double Dragon Neo, um, Mighty Switch Force 1 and 2, and all that stuff. But They're why doing... am I even bringing them up in the first place? Well, there's a reason why. We'll get back to the DuckTales one. But let me explain why I am even bringing them up for the rarity part. So, if you look up Shantae for the Game Boy Color and everything else, now there's some history with that because Shantae was released, I think, toward the end of the Game Boy's life and everything, alright? And it pushed the system to what it can do. Pretty much, if you wanted to see um, a Metroid-style kind of game done, except without it being Metroid-ish, but you want something something else to be done with it, well, that's Shantae in a nutshell for you, basically. Okay? That's what it's going and all that stuff. But the thing is, if you look up the pricing for Shantae here, which I'm about to do here so I can... 
So I got it right here. I, I got right, it right here. Go it's... ahead. So how much does it going for loose and complete before we it's get go... into the manual and all that stuff? It's going for two hundred and eighty dollars, roughly loose. <laughs> and for a complete inbox, that that's the ridiculous one. It's seven hundred and twenty-eight dollars, roughly. Does it have anything for the box and manual? Uh, let me see here. Yes. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Box only price. Uh huh. The box only is worth more than the game. It's two hundred ninety-nine dollars. What the hell, man? Manual. Uh -huh. Manual. Is a hundred and three dollars, so that's even more ridiculous of what I seen on Rule of Rose. So nice, you just broke that little record of mine, but okay. Da -da. Yeah, but now why did I bring this up as an example? Because there are sometimes where games are released toward the end end of the life of, of a console, and that's when sometimes it it can become more valuable. If you want something more recent, fine. How about Breath of the Wild? And all that stuff. Yes, that new Zelda game I am talking about. That was meant for the Wii and all that stuff. The Wii U. But it got sw going on to the Switch here. C has a copy of Breath of the Wild for the Wii and all that stuff. Would I ever play it? No, because I would just have it as a collectible thing for that case. Because why? Everyone's focusing on the Switch. And if people want the Wii U version, which I doubt, but if people did, guess what? We already have it and we're not scrounging around to go find another copy of it. So basically, the best time to gather games that are current, do it when the certain console that is dying, just get whatever you can on the later production games. So usually you can go to like GameStop or whatever and find out what the reservation list for those are. Once they are down to their end, as in you only have less than half a page left, yeah. see how much those are going for before everything gets phased out. Because once everything gets phased out, it's it's gone. And you probably won't see it unless it's being gouged for however much like Shantae or Rule of Rose or anything like that. And that's just alone on eBay. We're not even talking about going to find this in store or anything. And that means even local stores and all that stuff. That's not even including them in this whole equation either. Because one thing Price Charting never does, and I sh should have said this earlier, is that it doesn't track about what happens. It does not track about, you know, private sales or... Stuff like if you get from Second and Charles, Goodwill, or anything like that. So keep in mind, if you can find out places like those, do it, man. Just do it, because you'll be happy that you did. I mean, hell, one time, the labels kind of faded, but I found uh, Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo. And I only paid about maybe five to eight bucks for that thing. And that game's, uh, you know, a popular one as it is. So I made out like a bandit trying to got the, get in that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's just you know as an example saying that um, sometimes games go up the roof because either <laughs> all right. So pretty, like how we said, either it gets released or the end span of a lot of the life of a console, or it's because of limited print, or because a game company went out of business. Basically, okay. There's a fourth reason. All right, there is a fourth it. reason. Go for it. It is. The legal recall. <laughs> and this one here, folks, and I'm jealous of him, but it's more of well played. I wasn't expecting that, but well played. And now this one doesn't always happen, but wait until you hear this story. So go ahead, see. So this mainly went with the, the game Last of Us, okay? PlayStation 3 release. And it came out with a little statue of the two protagonists uh joel and ellie and the thing is is that when it came to the post pandemic edition naughty dog got in trouble with uh, legal matters pertaining to one actress ellen page considering how the little girl ellie has a very coincidentally likeness to her mm -hmm. and yeah. um the thing is is ellen was not in the really the best of moods when it came to her recent encounter with uh, video game voice acting. Unfortunately, things were not going her way. Uh, she was actually doing a game called Beyond Two Souls, which is actually not bad of a game either. Mm -hmm. But she was having legal matters with that on its own. But the thing is, is that when it came to Last of Us, she was flattered with Naughty Dog, basically. 
but she did not want her likeness on Ellie. So if you look on Last of Us Remastered for the PS4, you will see that they changed Ellie's physique and her likeness altogether. But having a statue of Joel and Ellie as Ellie's original body looks, it looks like Ellen Page. Now, when all of this legality matter came into fruition, they were recalling all of the Last of Us post-pandemic editions because of this little screw-up. Yeah. So, when it comes to recalls, one thing recommended to do if you want to be a really good collector, don't follow the recalls. Yep. Just, just don't. I mean, the thing about recalls is, yeah, you might get your money back, but you will probably have the pr the price of this thing skyrocket. And that's what happened in this little story. Uh, when I the the post pandemic edition actually costed a good hundred and twenty five dollars when I first got it, and right now it is shooting between nine hundred to over a thousand dollars. But a couple years back. Well, not even a couple of years back, but a couple months back, it was going for close to 5000 I mean, it's still Jeez. fluctuating as we speak, but people are actually trying to get this because it is out of print. You're never going to see it again, even if you do try. Yeah. And sometimes people can gouge this and they have every right to. That's the whole thing about this. It's that much of a limited print. Now, yeah. when it comes to uh, reservations on, like, GameStop things, right now, I just recently got the Stonemason version of the new God of War coming out. Why? Because it's, again, a statue situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the figurines are best to have, but you want to keep those in box. You probably don't even want to touch those. Uh, what I would recommend doing in order to keep the new price, because let me see, the new price, if... Yeah, it's roughly going for fifteen hundred to two thousand now, but that's that would be going for a lot more. That's just on eBay alone. Yeah. But, um, Which is crazy if you think about this here, folks. And this is about a video game of all things. Keep that in mind and put that into perspective with all this. If you want to play a physical version of the game, go ahead and get that special edition. Put it aside. Get a regular game, and just open that one up and play through it. Find a safe place for this, for, for the special edition, to where you can keep that and show it off if you feel like you want to. Yeah. In other words, one for showing, one for playing. That's yeah. the idea of the rule here, folks. Because when it comes to the loose and completes, fine. But to have a new price, you can actually tell someone, this is brand new. If I actually wanted to give it to you for this price... I'm not going to fluctuate on this because yeah. this ha this still has its wrapping on it. It's not damaged whatsoever. <laughs> so, and, well, uh, and I was about to say, I found something new that a lot of people won't believe and all that stuff here. And you know what, I, what I'm talking about here, see you already and all that stuff. But uh, let me explain. So, so a second and Charles, they have some free bit. They have free bins and all that stuff. And, you know, sometimes you find some decent things. Sometimes not. You went, for people who won't believe this, I found a sealed Warcraft, the first one, Orcs and Humans, sealed for free. <laughs> now, the I, thing with the free, the thing with the free is kind of odd with how they do it at Second and Charles. Basically, yeah. if they don't find any credit, they give it back to the owner, and they tell the owner, if you still don't want it, there is a free, uh tray outside that you can just put it inside we don't have any value for it unfortunately that does not mean that it's going to be useful to someone else when it came mm -hmm. to david here it was more of one person's trash one person's trash is another man's treasure that's basically what that is yep and let's just say when i saw that i took that son of a bitch so damn quickly i thought there was hands going right from the from you know steam coming right from my hands because i grab that so freaking quickly because i'm going hell yeah a sealed game of warcraft orcs and humans and i got this for free no one's gonna ever believe me on this whole entire thing <laughs> but yeah there's sometimes you get situations like that while mine isn't a, a big um situation like how it was with c's over here 
sometimes you just get lucky enough and you just never know when it's going to skyrocket the way it did. I mean, C got lucky with his stuff or else, you know, it probably would have been like, what? If it didn't, if that lawsuit didn't happen and all that stuff, how much would, would that have been? What's your guess on that one? Because my guess would have been at least about maybe 200 to 300 price range in that sense, depending on condition. Roughly, roughly, maybe about 500 at yeah. most. But see, because of that little lawsuit happened, look what happened. <laughs> yeah, it really, when it first happened like that, it skyrocketed to 5,000 and it just worked. But... But yeah, so it's just one of those things that just goes, holy shit, I made bank on this and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Which is just something that you can never really predict, but... Hell, sometimes things play in your favor, and you get it sometimes. That doesn't always mean you... It always works, but shit. <laughs> and then... Let me see here. I th let's see. I know we answered some of the other questions on here. And all that yeah, stuff. we are, we already oh, answered I the best method, too, pretty much, with just keep it in your budget. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, here's one that we're going to go over. How do you determine CIB? complete inbox now i have a story with this but before i get to my little fun time story because c had his and i get to have mine next um let's see go ahead and tell you what cib means and then i will tell my story about this one little incident and see you know exactly what the hell i'm talking about <laughs> so the best way to actually know what complete inbox is is like I said, it's mainly the game, the manual, and the case. The best way to determine that, if you want to turn a new price to a complete inbox price, is just remove the factory plastic. Just yeah. remove it, and then you have the complete price. Yeah. Um, I actually, I think you were referring for me to do the Persona Five. Yeah. Uh, difference. Yeah. It, okay. Uh, when that it comes to Persona or Five, when you wanted to do for that one, whatever like like I was like I was telling you guys before, when it comes to these limited edition things, you want to get the limited edition, keep it new, put it aside, and get yourself a different version of the game that isn't as costly. I actually have a complete version of the Steelbook edition of Persona Five that I'm playing around with, and the limited edition is staying in its plastic i'm not touching that one and what happened with that is even though it costed around like 80 dollars, it's now like 150 right off the bat new um let me double check that real quick but uh okay so the steelbook edition it's 45 new it would have been 74 well, 45 complete inbox 74 new but with Persona Take Your Heart Premium Edition, the limited edition, it would be right now, if I actually just removed the plastic, $117. And since I have it new, it's just short of $170. That was not even half of what it was when I, when I got it. It was around just under half. So that's even going up as we speak. All right. Now, should I go ahead and tell them the story that you yeah. know about? All right, so, so we have a friend named Matt and everything else, okay? Oh, used to in the or whatever here, and basically, um, he decided one day he was gonna have a bad buyer's impulse and everything, and so he did. He bought himself an anime figure from Boss Stage Arcade and everything, and we will get more into how this place comes into the story because it it's it's a crazy little story here, and basically. He decided he was going to buy this figurine and all that stuff. Now, personally, I'm not a guy who's big into anime figurines and all that stuff. Reason why being, um, most of the time I don't have either a room for it or there are not that much figurines I really like. Or to be honest, sometimes they're too pricey for my own taste. Everyone to their own, to their own, of course. So. He decides he goes ahead and does this. Now, what he does is something that he has buyer's remorse out of this whole thing. He trades in Lunar 1 and 2 for the PS1. That's complete. And with Lunar 2, he had the hard book cover um, of what was Manual. it? The guide. 
was it a manual or the guide for that one? The, the guide, basically. The the whole walkthrough. Alright, so the walkthrough of this whole thing. And he traded this for an anime figure. Then later, he comes talking to me and go, well, go ahead, hey, I need to pay my credit card bills or something else like that or some kind of bill or whatever. And basically, me and him made um, an agreement and all that stuff. And he told me saying that he would sell his Magic Knight Ray Earth to me. Now, before you guys ask, this was the Sega Saturn version, that was the North American version by Working the Science. As we said earlier, Working the Science made some pretty good games, and not only that, some of them are pretty valuable. Limited now, print. Quote, unquote, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and basically, he was going to sell me this. Now, at the time, it was at a different price than what it is now, and to give you guys an idea, I think it was in, what, 2015, 2016, I think it was here, and but it was going into the 200 price range or whatever or close to it, if I remember that right, or whatever. So what it's going for now here, and now I'm going to name off the prices, and this will come into play here. So for loose price, it was about, it's right now going for $176.11, complete goes for $306.59. Now, Matt wanted to get the whole get get for the complete price and everything else because normally with a game, it's with the case manual and you know, like I said, a game case and a manual, like I just said, I yeah, and everything else. But, but like we mentioned, when it comes to that on the complete inbox, it has to come with everything that came with the game to begin with. The only thing that is pretty much a let go are those little. Uh, like the little warnings or like the little advertisements that they used to have in the old NES, Super NES, even Sega Saturn stuff. Because that, no uh, one would ever really keep those, to be honest, unless they were very perfectionist about it, but I don't think anyone really kept them, to be honest. Unless they were in the box and they just didn't touch the box. Good on them. Yeah, and so pretty much he wanted us for like the $300 kind of dollar pricing. But if anyone knows this here, when it comes to Magic Knight Ray Earth, it was missing something that was crucial for it to be the complete stuff. It was missing the stickers that came with it. And me and him had a debate about this for a while, and C actually read all the Facebook text messages that we went through, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about with this whole entire thing. And I told him saying, I told him Matt saying, normally, yes, you normally can the games like that, there are normally case manual and everything else. Yeah, that would be complete pricing. But when it comes to a limited edition and all that kind of stuff, normally that will be considered loose if you don't have everything with it. Okay? And he didn't have the sticker, so it went down to the lower pricing and he wasn't too happy. But I said, don't look at me like I'm a weird person for it. But that's how it is because I'm not going to pay you. Your 300 to 200 bucks that it's worth and all that stuff, okay? Now, C over here actually made me a deal that I wouldn't refuse because, you know, it was something that I wanted. Now, C, now what's something that you, that you, what was the deal that you made with me originally if I was to get the Magic Knight Ray Earth game? So, considering the price of the actual Ray Earth game, I was gonna actually make a deal with David. To basically give him uh, games that would match the price of Ray Earth in mm -hmm. exchange for it. Because I am pretty much a fiend when it comes to working designs games. Not only that, but I am actually a decent Clamp fan as well. I actually liked Ray Earth. So uh, I pretty much told him, go ahead and do your deal with this guy. And yeah. if... I, I don't really like the way that he wants to do business, but go ahead and see if he will actually stick to his deal. If you are able to get Ray Earth off of him, we can do a whole separate transaction to where it's just a trade. You can yeah. get you can get the games. One of them I actually have multiple copies for. It's the Hack Quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got a third copy, and that is one of those. Damn it, man! What the hell? <laughs> How the fuck did you get that? Who, who, what god do you worship? Let me know so I can get the same fucking luck, man. That's what that kind of luck is. And he knows I've been wanting that game because I have parts one, two, and three. I just don't have fucking part four for this whole entire thing to complete the first part of Dot Hack over here. 
Right, and so what I told them is considering the price difference between those and how much you're actually paying for it, I can trade you that and also another game, if you wish, of whatever ones these that I have that you want. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that there, I decided, you know what, I'll go ahead and stick with it and see what he does and everything. And now, C has more history with Matt than I do here when it comes down to this. So, basically, the way how Matt did business is not how we would consider him doing really good in, and all that stuff. And C can run it better than I could for this here. But overall, um, he ended up backing out of the deal and going, you know what, I'm going to hold on to this and all that stuff. But what was the reason why and all that stuff that he backed out of it? Well... See, you know Matt better than I did here, and you know how he works and all this, when I when I was telling you about this whole thing. He just mainly has seller's remorse. I mean, the thing is, is while in the middle of the deal, he was just trying to get out of the deal, and all I was pretty much making sure you do is let him out of the deal, but make sure you get your money back. That's mainly all I really cared about. I, it, it, Like I said, I didn't like the way that he did business later on, and I was expecting him to do this with David to begin with. Yeah. Uh, this was due to recent problems, but the thing is, is this is all done and passed, and we're through with that. And, uh, everything is already passed, so water under the yeah. bridge. But the whole thing is that, you know, how's that answer with C CBI? Basically, or CIB, should I say. It goes like we just said. Everything has to be po complete. What the hell? I even asked Chaz about Dragon Warrior, for example. Because I have the box and manual that went with it. And the game. But not only that, but I have the Explorer's Guide. I have the guidebook, the poster. I have everything that went with it. The only thing I would have been missing, but that's a good luck to ever get it, would have been was to get the... Um, to get the letter from Nintendo, like if you got from Nintendo Power, say, thank you for getting this game and all that stuff there and everything else. But really, though, I even asked, um, see over here if, if, you know, everything was correct here, if I had everything. And then what, and see helped me out to define that there. And yeah, I had everything, so it was the right pricing. But, you know, that even shows that even I don't know everything or whatever. Because, like I said, every freaking game, every game has their own different editions. And it's good to ask someone else if they know it more than, I, than you do in this case. So don't ever be afraid to ask for help. Like I did with the whole Dragon Warrior thing. Because I have everything but Dragon Warrior 1. Hell, I even have Dragon Warrior 4. And that was... <laughs> And that was even lucky enough for me to even find that at second in charge when I wasn't looking for any of that in the first place. <laughs> right. And like I said, it's pretty... The, the whole thing about this uh, type of hobby is also, unfortunately, it is buyer beware. Because you could be dealing with people like what we just had to deal with. Yeah. But we, there are usually honest people when it comes to collectors. If If you got the money to actually get the thing and you get there before the other person... They're fine with you taking that. That It's just unfortunate. But if you don't, you bet someone is actually going to swipe it from underneath you. So yeah. uh, make sure that you have the funds to actually get what you want. And also, and like how we've been saying earlier is, or throughout this whole thing, is that if you're going to buy everything and all that stuff, sometimes it's cheaper to get the parts or the, or the other stuff like the manual and case, for example, more than it is to get the game and all that Well, stuff. except Shantae. <laughs> yeah, besides Shantae, yeah, of course. But if you do it differently and not try to be authentic, you can find other ways to make it work. Like, for example, sure, you can go ahead and try to go ahead and get a freaking um, original box for it and everything, okay? Yeah, sure, you can do that. But if you want to go through the custom way and all that stuff of actually getting like a hard case for it and all that stuff, you can do that because why? It's your way of deciding saying, hey, guess what? This is the way how I collect and this is my preference. You don't worry about what elitist collectors tell you otherwise because elitist collectors will be like, well, if it's not original and if it's not everything that came with it before, 
it's not worth its value on it. This and that and everything. And as we, long as you did your research on that, they're absolutely right. It's not worth the original value. However, you can go down a little bit because it is still complete, even if yeah. like the box is damaged to the point of being foobard. So uh, when it comes to that, just basically tell them, I could not keep the box. I did not have the box. So what I have is a case that works just as good. And it even has a higher security measure of even if it falls down, it's not going to damage the box. Yeah. And that's why for me, I personally prefer just hard cases in general, like the Sega Genesis, like kind of hard cases, because guess what? If they fall down to the ground, it's not going to bend the box. It's just going to go, poop. oh, it fell down. Here, let me pick you back up and put you back up. But it's not going to bend the box or anything like that, okay? And what I usually tell people is, you just do it the way how you want to do it. But, you know, everyone has their own definition for it. That doesn't mean you always, it's not, it's not a, a hobby where you compete and be like, no, I'm the one with the bear game now. I'm the one with the bear collection. Hurricaneer <laughs> kind of thing. It's nothing like that. <laughs> or is that supposed to be well, like the, that? But... The good news is that when it comes to price charting, you can also actually set up a free account. Yeah. And you can actually put down your entire collection of what you have so far. And that's and what me and C and have it, done. And they will actually ask you like what the condition is and even if you want to sell it you could just post it on price charting yep. and i'm pretty sure there will be someone who is interested that is also using the site who would be willing to take it off of your hands well there is like like for example there's one game that i wouldn't mind having and all that stuff and it's called fire and ice for the nes and all that stuff and i would not mind having it as a game that for me to actually buy off and all that stuff and selling i don't know whether it's selling it or not anymore and so if I'm looking and all that stuff at the market part of this here, selling is, um, it used to be there, but not anymore. But selling was selling for about 122 bucks, but that was a different pricing than how it is right now. Because before when I saw it was at like 127 or 133. So that just shows <laughs> how pricing goes for that. So, you know, it just depends on how you want to buy and go through all this mess as it is and stuff like that let's see now what were some other well, did we have any other questions or anything here that we had to answer for this that's pretty much it from what I can see and it seems like we've gone plenty into the subject matter on its own right and well, is there anything that you want to add to this? Like any last words for this whole entire podcast thing? And also, folks, if you guys ever want us to go more into depth about what we think about more of this, I mean, we can. But we will probably have people send us questions for something like this. So, you know, it's just a heads up thing. But go We ahead, might see. set up a podcast, but we might also just uh, answer the question directly as well. Um, this is actually... Uh, we've been trying to think of what to do as well. I was going to be doing recordings while David also does recordings and we just probably talk our way through it as well. So, um, just leave your input. I mean, if you like what you hear so far on this podcast, go ahead and subscribe, do what you feel like you want. And, uh, happy hunting, buyer beware, and just stay within your budget. Yep. And for my last words, I would say, collect for what you want and don't collect for what people are telling you to um, actually buy. Stay within the budget because that's the big thing of all of this. If nothing else, if you don't take away from it, is stay in the budget. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, what was it? What else here? Just, you know, if you guys like how we're doing this whole podcasting thing and all that stuff, yeah, leave us some feedback down below in the comments and all that stuff. And, you know, just tell us what you think about this here, or if we missed something, or whatever. I mean, we're open to feedback as it is, because, what, this is our first time doing, like, a podcast setup here, basically. <laughs> and everything right. else. But, you know, we're looking to see, and if you guys want us to re want us to revisit this, um, ish, um, this topic here, I mean, we will, but we'll probably like to see if people have other questions that we could try to answer and all that stuff, because what we mostly answered was just mostly, uh, a star these guide. Were, 
yeah, these were all questions that came off the top of our heads, just thinking about how beginners would ask certain questions. And this would hopefully help you set up a good collection to begin with of actual physical games. Yep, and also one thing I will say is that if you have one goal to collect only for this certain system or for that certain system, or whatever you feel like, make sure you say with within those um, in those areas before you start to venture off to somewhere else that might cost you more money. Because collecting video games, it can be an expensive hobby. Sometimes it can build up. It can be. It can build up over how much you spend. Yeah, but there's sometimes where you know you pay a hundred bucks for a game right away, and yeah, there's sometimes it gets that kind of expensive. So. Take it can it. sound it can sound like a drug habit really bad, but at least when it comes to video games, you can replay them as you go. That and <laughs> They're you, not a one-time use. Right, and if you really needed to, you could sell them if you needed to. I'm not going to say you're going to make tons of money off of doing it unless you have something that no one else has underneath the freaking sun kind of thing. But, yeah, for the most part, just enjoy, have fun with the hobby, and if you want to help out other collectors that's great we're just here trying to give what we think what people should be aware of basically and this whole craziness as it is so yeah i think that's about as far as i can tell here and all that stuff so guys happy hunting that's all i gotta say yep and stay within the budget as the last reminder peace out peace